thank you very much, and thanks to Chicago. It's my first time to Chicago. I'm moving over here to set my water down. Um, and we've had a great time, so I appreciate uh, the hospitality. So obviously here, talk a little bit about uh, Archie's Acres and, uh, and, and what we do exactly. Um, we purchased our farm in 2005, and um, Karen had this idea of ha uh, actually moving to Italy. She uh, did a lot of business in, in Italy, and uh, uh, she had this idea of having a farm in Tuscany. I was doing multiple deployments back and forth to the Middle East, and uh, I was really looking forward just to come back to California. Um, we had a friend, a real estate agent, who uh, had some property in North County, San Diego, and she said, come check this place out, which we did. And it was a good fit, because North County, San Diego is very much like Tuscany. It's the avocado capital of the world. A little tidbit of information. The largest uh, community of organic farms and, uh, and the 16th largest agricultural economy in the United States. So um, we, we bought this property, had roughly 200 avocado trees on it, but they haven't been watered in about two years because the house is in probate. I was still in the military at the time. She had to move in by herself because I was deployed. Uh, and when I got back, I had a lot of free time on my hands because we made the intent of leaving the military. And uh, so I started playing around with these avocado trees and really enjoyed it. But through that process, we learned a lot of interesting information to include how much water the avocado trees need and how little water uh, the Southwest has. Um, particularly in San Diego, we pay about $1,300 per acre foot of water. Uh, you may not understand what an acre foot is, but in comparison, growers closer to the Colorado River pay about $20 per acre foot, and other parts of the United States pay about $5 to $10 an acre foot. So we pay anywhere of excess 100% more for water. Um, and so that drove a lot of our thinking, particularly being that uh, being a military family and uh, global instability and so forth. And so what we did is we incorporated hydroponics and greenhouses into uh, our crop production methods, which is about 90% more water efficient. Uh, by taking the crop out of soil, you eliminate about 70% of um, problems from pests and, and diseases, which means less of emphasis needed on uh, pesticides, and herbicides, and so forth. Um, we also incorporated certified organic techniques. And so the only thing we need now to control pests are, are ladybugs and lace wings and so forth. So, um, and we kind of grew this idea. Um, but again, it's uh, really influenced a lot of our decision making when we started to really understand the water situation. What you see here is a, a global map of water scarcity. Um, you can see the entire southwest of the United States, which is the largest agricultural sector in the world, is very scarce on water right now, as, as, as well as the uh, parts of the East Coast. And then obviously North Africa and the Middle East and so forth. Um, very scarce on water. So what does that mean when you're scarce on water? You're also scarce on food, and you're also scarce on energy. And what we find is, again, Here's a uh, scarcity of food, and I, but I think if, if you looked at uh, Egypt today, and this map's a little bit old, that you'd find it's even more uh, scarce than it's shown in this map, places like Tunisia as well. Um, but what you find is uh, there's a correlation between areas that lack food and areas that are high in violence. In fact, uh, if the whole, whole uh, Arab Spring was started by a, a, a farmer's market vendor in Tunisia who was having a hard time uh, getting products to sell because of 10% rise in global food prices. And obviously the, the government in Tunisia is very corrupt. So uh, uh, a government representative came down to this vendor asking for a bribe. He said, I don't have anything. They spilt his, his vendor cart over and, and spit on him and this and that. Uh, the next day, he went down to the government building, set himself on fire, and Tunisia uh, erupted, followed by e Egypt, now Libya, and so forth. And so again, I'm just trying to call it, draw a correlation between uh, violence and a lack of food and a lack of food due to lack of water and so forth. Um, and then again, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, North Korea and so forth, all areas that have lack of uh, availability of, of food and that we hear about all the time. Again, the Wall Street Journal talking about the anti-government protests are 100% related to the 10% rise in, in global food prices and that not only us, Karen and I, but Economists see this relationship between rising cost of food and uh, growing uh, uh, global insecurity. But we can really bring this at home, and, and what you see here is a map of uh, southwest LA, the city of Inglewood. If you don't know Inglewood, it's not known to be the safest streets in the world. Um, and what the flags are is areas that are known for 
uh, vendors of good food. So what you see those flags are like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. You can see there's actually none in the city of Inglewood itself. And you can't blame these companies because it's a poor neighborhood and they need to go to more affluent communities that can afford uh, the better food. But what you see here is the access to liquor and, and fast food. And as you go further into Los Angeles, Compton, East LA, you see that it gets more denser of fast food and, and alcohol. And you move out west where the more affluent communities is, you see those, uh, those numbers start to fall. So again, even domestically, I think we can see a relationship between the access of good food and, uh, and, and high uh, crime rates and so forth. So, I mean, what's the answer? Do we force Whole Foods to build a, a store in Inglewood? Well, no, of course not. We're not gonna be able to change those dynamics, but what we can change is where that food's produced and how hydroponics can affect that, being that we take the crop out of soil and so forth, and, uh, and we think we can, um, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? These people don't have money, so they can't afford food, but we can bring crop production to them, create jobs, and they have money and access to the good food. The challenge is with agriculture is we have uh, a, a continually growing uh, population, not only domestically, but globally, and a huge influence on domestic energy production. But which is, And that's because we export about $500 billion for foreign energy that I think we could all agree can be better used at home. And what we see here is how we use water in the United States. Most people probably think the number one user of water in the United States is agriculture, and that makes sense, but it's actually not. Domestic energy production is the number one user of water in the United States. So if we want to produce more energy domestically, we have to learn how to use our water sources better in other sectors to include uh, energy production. So when we talk about a lot of these things, people think, well, we're screwed, you know, people are going to die and all this. <laughs> um, but what we really think about that is great market opportunities, right? I mean, we, we've we're using technology that's 90% more water efficient. And what you see here is a, uh, a map of actually how we use irrigation in the United States. You see gravity acres, meaning flood irrigation. That's where you take your entire lot of land and flood the whole thing. Very water inefficient, still widely used. Sprinklers, the widest used method of irrigation. But a lot of that water doesn't even hit the ground, just turns to vapor and we lose the water due to uh, uh, vapor loss and so forth. Um, drip and micro irrigation much more water efficient than any of these methods. And you see how much of it we don't use. Very small portion of growers in the United States use drip and micro irrigation. And then hydroponics and greenhouse production isn't even on the radar. So there's plenty of opportunity where we can uh, use water more efficiently, produce food, uh, better food for a global, uh, gro continued growing global population, and, and, and tap into uh, a great market. The food and fiber industry is a $1.3 trillion industry in the United States. Most people don't think of the United States as an agricultural economy, but just go down to Washington, D.C., and if you look at the architecture down there, it all resembles, uh, for instance, the large columns made on marble. If you look closely, the corn stalks tied together. That's what they're actually shaped to be, tobacco leaves and so forth. So we're very much still an agricultural economy. The organic food market continues to grow at a rate of 10%. You think in this economy, being that it's a premium price for organic food, um, people wouldn't be spending that money on it, but what, they, what we think they're doing is actually uh, spending more on food and less on health care. Um, and our exports for agriculture is great. We have about $110 billion surplus in agricultural exports, and we're continuing to see those rise. And then you can see uh, the growing global population and estimates of where the population is going to be in the near future. What that means to a grower is market potential, because that's more customers that we get to feed. Jim Rogers, you may know about him. He's a very successful investor. Uh, Time Magazine just did an article on him. And the title of that magazine is, If You Want to Make More Money Than a Banker, Become a Farmer. Again, it's a great time to get into the market because of growing, uh, growing uh, food prices and the need for more uh, food production. Two thirds of the growers are reaching retirement age in the United States. There's really nobody taking those, uh, taking those places. What we think we did is uh, develop the um, Xbox of agriculture and it's going to appeal to younger people. So what we, the other emphasis is, again, being that we're a military family, is you look at these guys here, and basically what we're asking them to do right now, these, these Marines in this picture, one of which the, 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 the gentleman in the bottom there is flipping us off, James, Terry James, he's actually a Chicago resident, and uh, he, he, he would make Chicago proud if you see him in, in actions. But what we're asking these guys to do, go spend two years in Iraq or Afghanistan on and off, and come back and start at the bottom of the food chain again. 
go find a minimum job if you're lucky. We spend roughly a million dollars in everybody we deploy, but we lose that investment when we come back because there's 300,000 homeless vets on the streets and so forth. Um, and so Sergeant Vlasic, a scout sniper with my platoon, are we going to ask this guy with all these talents, with all this money invested, to come back to the United States and, and work a minimum wage job? Is that what we're offering? What we're offering this, this is Corey Pollard, uh, a Marine with 1st Battalion, 5th Marine, Special Operations Capable, spent about two years in Iraq. Um, he's been with us for about two years now, I think. And uh, he was, lived in a poor city, of, a poor side of uh, San Diego. His family, all of his family still lives in the same house. He wanted to get out of that house. That's why he joined the Marine Corps. Came back, he tried trucking, didn't really enjoy it. He gave our farm a chance, and he loves it. He's been there ever since, making more money than he ever has. Um, and he tells his friends when they're asking him what he's doing, I'm a farmer. And they have this, this idea that he's out there in overalls driving a tractor, <laughs> not uh, wearing latex gloves, operating millions of dollars worth of equipment in our greenhouses and so forth. Um, and so this idea of integrating young veterans into this growing uh, agricultural sector uh, under the leadership of my wife gave birth uh, to our VSAT program. So VSAT is Veteran Sustainable Agriculture Training. And what we do is we transition combat veterans into sustainable organic agriculture as a career. And what we really believe is the leadership skills that they gain in the military translate perfectly into sustainable organic agriculture. We offer them the opportunity to start their own crop production. We do a six-week training program. And at the end of that six weeks, they actually have an opportunity. They're creating a business plan. And then they present that business plan in front of a panel of experts. We have bankers, private investors, um, HR departments, farmers, and business owners. And they're able to. Um, they're able to take their business plan, present it. We have people that step up and offer opportunities. I know we're nearly out of time. I'm going to end with a story. We had a nine-year recon Marine that joined us in January. He um, had been you know, highly, highly decorated. He transitioned out of the military and found himself homeless for nearly two years. We met him at an Earth Day, um, an Earth Day event. And he actually came up, couldn't believe that we had veterans and sustainable in the same sentence. We talked him into taking the program. He had a very difficult time with the idea of being anywhere for six weeks. And what he did was he actually ended up creating the business plan for a hot sauce. He was thinking he's homeless, he doesn't have land, he doesn't have money. So he created something that he figured he could manage. So he created a hot sauce um, out of superfoods. And he was a forager because he was, he lived under the trees. <laughs> so he foraged for his own food. And so that is Mike from Forager Mike's Superfoods. He actually created that business plan. He presented it. One of the private investors stepped up and said, this is amazing. That's delicious. I'm going to do it. And so it's a raw, organic hot sauce. Mike looked at him and said, are you crazy? <laughs> I don't have any means to do this. And the investor said, you know what? I get it. I get it and I get you. And that investor stepped up. Mike owns 75% of his company. The investor owns 25% of the company. It's being bottled at a, a certified organic plant in Temecula. And that is launching on the shelves in Whole Foods nationally on November 10th of this year. And so what we really believe as we come you know, to the close of our, our presentation, we really believe that, that you know, the veteran sustainable agriculture training is our way to reach back to our transitioning military. And it was, it was my husband's way to continue to serve. And so um, if you want to help, I mean, this is how you can help. You know, look for the VSAT graduate logo. You know, if you see a product that comes out with that, you're helping when you make that purchase. And you, know, you can sponsor a veteran through a scholarship. Um, we're vet leasing. We're just about to expand. We're going to be expanding out to five different locations in the next year, Washington, DC, Boston, um, Florida, uh, Northern California in Los Angeles, and then also um, further north. But thank you for having us today. And I, I know we're out of time. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay.